welcome. Welcome to what I think is going to be a lovely and unusual class. The, uh, the title actually is A Musical Journey in Central Asia, The Jewish Diaspora Along the Silk Road, uh, which is a, an area that I don't think very many of us know very much about. Um, so just the usual housekeeping things. The class will end at 6.15. We will take the last 15 minutes of it for questions. And after 6.15, the Zoom, the Zoom uh, room will stay up for 15 minutes for discussion. Uh, but I don't know whether Adam will stay for that. He might. And, I'm not and I don't know whether Susan and I will stay. You don't need us. <laughs> um, so that's. That's the time situation. Now, I know I think it's somewhere else in the little script here, but as long as we're talking about, about time and questions, I wanna tell you that what we're going to do with questions is that if you have questions, and I hope you do, you will put them into the chat. And then, because you will be muted, put them into the chat and I will relay um, the questions to Adam during those last 15 minutes and perhaps even during the piece when he's changing instruments and there's a little bit of a, of a lull. Um, and there's his, there's his wall, which is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, so if you have a question, put it in the chat. Now, it would be nice if you haven't already, to put your pronouns in your in with your name, in your um, in your little Zoom screen, and did I mention that Susan Bear is our tech angel, and a very good tech angel she is, and also that the class is being recorded, and if that's something that you don't wish to take part of, then you should turn off your video now. And also that the uh, class will use uh, closed captions for anybody who uh, needs them. So why don't we just get to the prayer for study Everybody ready? Baruch Atai, Baruch Atai, Baruch Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlom, Asher Kedshanu B'mitzvotav, Vitzivanu La'asok Dibivdre Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of all, who hells us with mitzvot, commanding us engage with words of Torah. Okay, now we have a few, just a few other little things that we need to do before we can get Adam on the screen here. There is no, there is no structure that I can tell you about this particular class. This is Adam and all the wonderful things that he has to say and to play and to introduce you to the music of this part of the world. So one little, one little thing that we need to talk about is, and I don't think it will come up at all here, is that we, we wanna, somebody touches on something controversial that the idea is no, there is no right and no wrong here. So you know that, and if you've been taking other classes, I'm sure you've heard that in those classes also. So I think without further ado, I should, we should introduce Adam Grode. Adam Grode. Hi everybody. I'm gonna, let me just 
Yes, there's Adam, but I'm going to just say a couple of words about you. Sure. He, um, probably one of the, the, the most, the things he is most proud of is that he had two Fulbright fellowships. He is a senior researcher at the Smithsonian Asian, Asian Cultural History Program. He speaks, what was it, five, six languages, seven? Give about, yeah. And not the easy ones, not, not French and Spanish and Italian, more like the, the um, languages that are spoken along the Silk Road in Central Asia. He went to Union College for his undergraduate work and he did graduate work at Penn um, in, he'll tell you, because I, I can't, we, we talked about this and it was sort of like a combination of, of um, anthropology and musicology. And he, he created a word, but I can't pronounce it. So I will just leave it at that. Um, so without ado, Adam. Yes. Thank you so much for the introduction to Dell and for Susan and Ellen as well for organizing this event. As mentioned, my name is Adam Grode. I'm a Philadelphia native, uh, but I have spent the majority, I would say, of these past two decades since graduating from Union College uh, traveling and living along the Silk Road. Uh, how exactly this, uh, this American Jew from outside of Philadelphia found himself in this terra incognita is uh, as a story that I'd like to share with you for the next hour. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you for attending this day of learning uh, here with us today. Um, basically, the story goes as follows. Um, I lost my father at the age of seven and he was a bass player in college. And so I tried to follow in his footsteps by taking up the bass, which as a seven year old, the upright bass is a very intimidating instrument. Um, I should have had it restrung on a cello, but with, you know, foresight at that time, um, I, I quit after a year or two, but then with my bar mitzvah, I took up the electric bass as he used to play. Um, when I was a freshman at Union, I did a, a, a summer term abroad in Nice. Uh, before that happened, I took my first class in, in uh, ethnomusicology about the music of Latin America, and it was on a whim. This is back in 2001, before Skype. That I was uh, I was doing a, um, uh, an essay about uh, Andre Segovia and a series of suites he wrote. Andre Segovia is the is the uh, the father of the modern classical guitar. And so on a whim, I, I called up the Mozartium to speak to Elliot Fisk, who's another uh, Philadelphia native and the protege of Segovia. And you know he just loved the fact that I called him up. It was the middle of the night for me, but during office hours for him somehow, luckily. And he invited me to study with him in Siena at the Academia Musicana Chigiana, uh, right there in the Campo, if you've ever been to Italia. And this was perfect timing. It would have lined up right after I finished my program in Nice. Uh, but as fate unfortunately turned out, uh, you know, some people in my family didn't quite think that I had the chops to even get past the entrance exam, let alone to study with someone as renowned as Elliot Fisk. Um, and so, I mean, that, that was a very expensive summer already, uh, spending six weeks in, in, in Nice and, and studying. So I came back to the U.S. a little bit dejected, but even more inspired to pursue music abroad. And boy, did I get a chance to do that. Uh, so I finished the French faculty and I, I wanted something that connected more with my roots. Uh, I was going to be studying German. And no, no one really offers Yiddish so much. And so I thought... Um, why not do another UN language and pursue Russian, uh, which we did have at Union College. And when I did that, something in me just awoke. I don't know if it's, about, if it's whether or not studying not your second language, but your third language that the, the pedagogical process really just clicks. But something in me just, it felt like it felt natural, even though the, the, the case system and the grammar is, is absolutely insane. And so when I went to uh, uh, Russia, we had a choice between three towns. One was Peter, uh, St. Petersburg, uh, Moscow, and the town of Vladimir, which is on the golden ring, the Zolpoy Kotso of, of Kiev and Rus. This is the old uh, principalities before Muscovy would rise to power. Um, and so I instantly chose Vladimir. I wanted more borscht and less burgers. I did not want any opportunity to study English. And it was during that time that I had a chance to study the Ukrainian prima. 
And I chose the Ukrainian prima over the balalaika because as my family comes from the Pale of Settlement, uh, we basically were the first, uh, um, I was the first person to return to this area and speak not our mother language, but I guess you could say our colonial uh, language. And so it was this time then that I, I had a chance to have private one-on-one -on -one lessons, you know, with master and the apprentice. And it was uh, my, my teacher's son, Igor, um, who invited me into his circle of friends. We were of the same age and it was a blessed and magical experience. We went to his dacha, uh, his cottage. We, we looked for mushrooms in the woods to make mushroom soup um, and all of the other sorts of, um, uh, I guess you could say, fairy tale sort of uh, uh, Russian experiences that, that you can imagine. And so just to set a small little pretext of where we're going to be coming from, uh, I don't really have any klezmer experience, but I do have some Russian folk music. And so we're going to start off with this first song, which is one of my favorites. It is called Katusha. So here we go. <laughs> And so the Silk Road, the great Eurasian trade network that stretched from Rome to China, actually went all the way up to Norse, up the Volga River, and had trade extensions trading for fur and musk and other items towards Kievan Rus. Um, now, it was at this time that we had a small excursion, uh, a week-long excursion along the Volga River, and we took a trip to Yaroslav, uh, Nizhny Novgorod, and then we ended up in Kazan, which is the capital of Tatarstan. And it was there that I could distinctively say that my Silk Road romance actually began. It was the onion-shaped architecture juxtaposed by the piercing minarets of the of the mosques. And together uh, at the at the Kremlin, at the at the at the uh, uh, citadel of Kazan, where you could see the melange uh, just take place right before your eyes. Well, I was, I was enchanted right then and there. And so I thought when I returned to Union College that I would use my remaining time to try to go further into the heart of Eurasia. And again, because we didn't have like anything like uh, Turkic languages or really Persian languages, what we did have at Union was Chinese. And because of Chinese Central Asia, specifically Xinjiang, um, I used again, like, like I would use Russian to go into set, uh, former Soviet Central Asia, I would be using Chinese to access parts of Xinjiang. And so immediately upon my return, I was lucky enough to ta have the one class at Union, which is a small school, just 2000 students, the one entire class offered, which is art and archaeology of Central Asia, 
uh, was being offered. And I remember at the time I was preparing for these art history exams, these archaeological exams, and I was listening to the two CD set by uh, that was curated by Yo-Yo Ma and produced by uh, Smithsonian Folkways, which was uh, two, 2003 musical caravan. And I'd be listening to this uh, two disc album nonstop while preparing for exams. And it was actually, uh, oh, pardon me. Uh, it was, um, it was it's, it's funny when I look back at this two disc album, uh, you know, it's, it's been uh, whew, 17 years later um, that uh, I basically lived my life like the liner notes itself. And I learned many of the songs that have been featured on this two disc album. And it's just incredible that, you know, I could flip back to these, uh, this art history book of mine that we had, and I've been to many of the sites, I've learned many of the songs, and I could say to myself, yeah, I actually fell enamored with this one particular topic and pursued it to its uh, highest degree. So moving further, um, I have one little item of transition here, and this is, in the West, we call this the Jews harp. Uh, but in Central Asia, it is uh, called the uh, steel harp, temer komus or shans komus, um, and it is found all over Eurasia, uh, from Romania to Indonesia, and we have the little... Now, why it's called a juice harp, there's a few different um, uh, etymological reasons. Uh, the French like a, would call it a jeu, like a, a, a toy harp. Uh, possibly it was imported from Jewish merchants into England. Uh, that name kind of escapes us. But it is with this sound that we go from Kazan, which is known as Sarai. It was the capital of the uh, Alten Orda, which is the Golden Horde, Orda Horde. And that is where the Mongols, after their like, expansion throughout Eurasia, basically set up their one last Khanate in, um, in, in Kazan, and they would be attacking the, uh, the golden ring of tu uh, Suzdol and Tula and Vladimir and Moskva and Moscow uh, until the time of Ivan Grozny, which is uh, Ivan the Terrible. And that marked a period of expansion for Russian uh, imperial history that would not stop until Alaska. And actually, they even had a trading outpost in California as well. Um, however, so, uh, <clears throat> and because of this expansion, uh, they, you know, access to Siberia, a lot of the Central Asian territories, this is where we found a lot of the dissidents, uh, the uh, prisoners, the, the undesirables of the, of the Tsarist uh, government were basically exiled to. And many of such people were sent to Siberia and also Kazakhstan, which as, um, you may or may not know from the recent films of Borat, it's a very nice country. I spent actually four years in Kazakhstan. I loved it there. I find the, the culture to be incredible, but it's where uh, I met many of the first Jewish people that uh, have been there, or many of the first Jews that were living in Central Asia. And these were Ashkenazi Jews that were living by transplant in, uh, in Kazakhstan. For example, um, well, he's not Jewish, but Dostoevsky, for example, was sent to Kazakhstan. And that's where he, uh, I think he catch tuberculosis at some, at some point. Um, but it's such a far away place from the Pale of Settlement that it just wants, I just want to highlight on how a different of a musical landscape uh, the Ashkenazi Jews found themselves um, at, you know, it, between the uh, 18th to up towards the present day. And so in this region of Central Asia, the Altai region, this is actually where 15,000 years ago, uh, the Native Americans, well, it was the expansion from across Kamchatka, it was known as Kamchatka, and the uh, uh, Bering Strait, and down and towards the, the plains of America, and, and basically the, the entire Native American population, which it can be proven genetically, comes from this one region, in Central Asia, the Altai region. And we could prove this with genetics, but also with things such as the yurt, which is the circular nomadic dwelling that many Mongols and, and Kazakhs and Kyrgyz still reside in today. And it's very much resembles the teepee of the Native Americans. So there's a lot of uh, uh, shamanistic musical traditions and beliefs that have been shared that still reside today, despite being continents apart. So it is with this that we now, that I found myself in Central Asia um, immediately after college, I was lucky enough to win a uh, 
a Watson Fellowship, which is, I guess you could say, a Fulbright on steroids. And you're about to, you could choose uh, any project you want, any countries you want. So I was connecting my passion for, for Russian and for Chinese. And I was connecting the dots from like musical Marco Polo from starting in Venice and I ended up in Japan. And uh, this is the, the two string Kazakh Dombra, D-O-M-B-R-A. And it is the cousin of the Dutar, which is right here. Here's the Dutar from uh, Xinjiang and also the Dutar uh, from uh, from uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and we have the Tofshur from Mongolia. Uh, the Dutar, which is what this family belongs to, so if we count to three in French, on du toi, du means two in Farsi. Tar simply means string. So this is a two-stringed instrument. Uh, so using the tar, I like to call this my world on a string because it is arranged geographically. Um, the guitar, for example, has its roots from chahar, which is four, and the only reason why it has six strings is because the Italians first added a bass note, like the oud, and then again the Spaniards added a higher note, uh, which is the sixth, and which is uh, the Spanish guitar was brought across the seas to America, and as we know, is awesome today and known worldwide. It's basically, I guess you could say, the most global of instruments, um, well, at least among the lute family, that is. <clears throat> So we have the two stringed dombra here, and it is extremely nomadic, extremely shamanistic. This song is called Babraun. It means honeysuckle in Kazakh, in Kazakh. But basically it was composed in 1850 and it's a kui. It's, it's a, a genre kind of like Shakespearean blues where there's five parts to each kui and each ending of the kui has um, kind of like a melodic contour to the original theme, just like the acts of any Shakespearean theater. And so this is about two ponies playing in the step and you can hear the little dunk, 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 dunk. you hear the trample right from the onset. And so here we go with Bab Raun, uh, composed by Kormangazi and <clears throat> So you can imagine for the for the Ashkenazi to be in this, uh, I mean, quote unquote, most oriental of places in, in the uh, in the Russian Empire. This was a very, very far step, pun intended, uh, uh, for them to find themselves in. Now, this is completely juxtaposed by, if you just give me one moment, Tito. Adam? Yes. Um, an interest, uh, a question just came in. It sure. really has to do with the instruments. Oh. It says, are the instruments that Adam is showing us still played? And in what contexts? They most certainly are played. The Dombra is even featured on the banknotes of Kazakhstan. Um, each of these instruments, I have personally 
uh, formally practiced and learned while abroad, and they are featured across monuments uh, on the monies themselves. They are uh, especially among the former Soviet countries, which have been able to reestablish their own national identity. And during Soviet times, a lot of them were uh, forbidden or just uh, or, or very tightly, tightly managed. Um, you know, there was not a lot of cultural expression that was permitted. So I would say that these are not just, uh, uh, you know, popular, but they are very much part of the, the, the zeitgeist in each of the countries they represent. There's one other, this is not a question, but this is from uh, Darina Ivanova says, wow, I never expected to hear this song at an American synagogue's event. <laughs> if I remember correctly, I studied it at school as a child in Bulgaria in the original. Uh, probably Katusha, the, the first song, I imagine. Yes. Yeah, the yes. First, not this one, the first one. Well, um, I mean, I can try to improvise some, some klezmer music if we got time later, but uh, in the meantime, I would like to play from a genre that is exactly Jewish. It's part of not the Ashkenazi, but it's part of the Sephardic tradition. Now, North Africa, Persia, uh, from 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 this part of the diaspora, uh, from Persia up north, uh, we find the Jews of Bukhara. And Bukhara today is an oasis that is situated inside Uzbekistan, but it is the Persian speaking part of Uzbekistan. And they share um, a musical tradition much more similar to, to uh, Tajikistan. And it is here that we find the two string dutar. But more importantly, the genre known as Shashmukam in, in uh, Persian, in Tajiki, in Bukhara, in Shash means six, and Mukam from Egypt uh, all the way to Xinjiang, China. Mukam is, is like a Muslim classical suite of music. Um, but it was most interesting because during uh, the, the great game, as I mentioned in the little promo, this was the, the 18th, 19th century conquest of Central Asia on behalf of Tsarist Russia and the British Raj. Um, it, was a, it was a time of conflict where borders were constantly changing, alliances were flipping as often. Uh, well, it was, it's, it's a very sophisticated and, and, and difficult period to really understand all, all of the intricacies. Central Asia itself with, with its, uh, I guess you could say, a half dozen mutually exclusive languages, major languages. There's lots more minority languages uh, that are near extinction today, but with its uh, mutual exclusive languages and religions and 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 uh, and cultures, uh, it is it is a most difficult region I would say to access. And so, with the exception of Hindustan or uh, India, Pakistan, that area, uh, I have over the course of two decades taken chunk by chunk, language by language instrument by instrument, note by note, uh, further into this region that is, I would say, to just a generation ago, probably the most forbidden region for Americans to travel to. Uh, yet it is a region where I continue to find myself. And it was uh, two summers ago during this uh, mo my most recent Fulbright that I was able to study in this Shashmakam tradition. And I gave a final performance with the National Ensemble, where my master, my Ustad, uh, is the lead dutar player, uh, Sarajuddin Jorayev. He's also a master musician with the Aga Khan Music Foundation. Um, and, you know, I was wearing my kippah, and in a country just north of Afghanistan, I tell you, I could not have felt more at home. And so this one song is called Zulfi Parashon. It's about a curly-haired girl. And here we are on the... Well, I think I'm actually going to switch it up for one dutar for another, just because this one, while it is gorgeous, I will instead pick up this slightly larger one 
uh, because it plays into the next instrument. This one is from uh, northwest China in the Hoja Ili Valley, where a major, uh, the Sino Soviet split occurred in 1972. <laughs> So slightly larger, slightly deeper, and it is the longest of long neck lutes that I possess. Uh, and so I really do take to this dutar quite a bit. Um, and we can see some of the geometrical inlay here, but we'll get to that with the next instrument in just one moment. So here we are with the part of the six part classical musical suite of Shashmukam with Zulfi Parashon. And if you couldn't tell, I threw in a little Ine Matona Banayim just in the middle there, uh, just to give a little sense that while, while this music may seem very foreign to a lot of us, but it honestly reminds me uh, so much of when my, uh, with Cantor Allen at, back at uh, Knesset Israel in Elkins Park, when he would sing during synagogue when I was just a kid, a lot of this reminds me of the, of the religious Jewish music. I mean, it's, it's in a minor tone, but they're not sad songs. And so a lot of this melodic contour resonates deeply for me. And so uh, it, was very, it was very easy to find myself within this tradition. And uh, it, it's with that that, you know, I'd like to, to move on to one more. Uh, we're moving quite along rather quickly here. Uh, I'd like to present what would be my most favorite of instruments along the Silk Road. <clears throat> and it is... The instrument here, this is the double body tar from, uh, from, from Bukhara uh, that is found in Persia. And this is what the, gives shape to all of the double bodied instruments, such as the, from the violin to the contrabass. Uh, but it, it comes from this family of the barbat or the erbek, which is featured very slightly uh, in the Book of Psalms, but it is called the rawap, R-A-W-A-P. And it's from Kashgar. It has seven strings with mulberry wood with goat bone and horn inlay and a snakeskin resonator. Now it has seven strings, but I'm only going to be playing 
on one. Just like we have the tar, the tar has 11 strings. I only basically play on one main string of the tar. Um, if anyone plays piano, it is almost like the open pedal, the sustain pedal, where if you press one note, all of the dampers are levy, and basically all of the strings reverberate together. And so while it has a very tiny corpus, very tiny body here, it packs a very large sound. And if you, excuse me, it, it is a little bit difficult to play as I'm gonna just show you in a moment. So if you don't mind me, it is getting a little hot in here. Now, the fun thing about this instrument is that it is, uh, you put it on your forearm and kind of like if any of you have seen any, an electric bass player play like the electric bass kind of uptight, like right here, it's kind of like that position, but just twirled around. And this instrument comes from Kashgar, which about three centuries before the Shash Mukam was created, the 12 Mukam was established by the Uyghurs. This is the Muslim Turks living in Western China. And Oniki Mukam in Turkic language is for the 12 Mukam. Each Mukam is two hours. So this is literally 24 hours of music. And it was during the, uh, the Yarkin dynasty uh, of the 16th century that Amani Sakhan, the famous empress, put down into notation uh, the 12 Mukam. And in this region, I was able to spend a lot of time for both during Watson and I formally spent the, uh, my entire Fulbright in this area. And I'm gonna just very briefly play some uh, from, from the second Mukam called Chave Tazia. <clears throat>
Thank you. And so from the six mukam, we have part of the 12 mukam. Um, now, these classical suites since the 1600s have been basically, I guess you could say, almost frozen parts of music um, in the sense that you know, they have been notated and note for note. I mean, there there is room there or rather, I could say there was room for improvisation, interpretation. But uh, like I mentioned before, with many uh, uh, cultural policies during the Soviet Union, this is very tightly restricted, and this is even more the case today uh, in the People's Republic of China, where the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, uh, there is, I, for a lack of any shorter, shorter term, there is a cultural genocide happening this very moment, uh, which I think for, um, for the Jewish population here to raise awareness about this, and not just awareness, but appreciation for that which is being uh, erased from you know memory as 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 as, qu as quickly as as they could uh, you know raise sites and traditions, uh, music is intangible cultural heritage. Uh, it is something that cannot be erased. I think, uh, and it can only reverberate in the future if we choose to remember it. Um, so it is with this next song. Uh, that I featured in my little promo, and I call it the Central Asian Stairway to Heaven because of all of my travels, this still remains to this day my most cherished uh, uh, song that I have to date, to date uh, been able to learn. It's been my pleasure to learn this song. And a quick little story about to, who the uh, the namesake of this song is, is. His name is Tashvai. And during the same period that the, that the 12 Mukam was being uh, delineated, Tashvai was kind of like a Uyghur Robin Hood, uh, except he would, instead of riding horses, he'd be on a donkey and he'd be playing his Rawap as well. So there's an old version of Tashvai uh, and there's a new version of Tashvai. The new version was reinterpreted by Korban Ibrahim after the Cultural Revolution ended in 1976. And it's my hope that after this uh, next period uh, that it maybe I could do a... a, um, a you know, collaboration or at least reinterpret uh, Korban Ibrahim's reinterpretation to mark to set this next stage of, of uh, reinvigorated uh, a culture uh, of the Uyghurs in Northwest China. Um, this song I, I learned when I first picked up the Rawap and as you can see it's very difficult to play with your little goose shape right here but actually a lot of the weight falls on this hand and because these are not inlaid frets, these are actually wrapped with nylon. Before they used to be with uh, dried sheep intestine. What my master would do, Abdul, uh, would he would basically touch on the inside of my on my palm right here to see if I was developing any kind of um, uh, oh, what were they blisters? I guess you could say <laughs> calluses. Yes, thank calluses, you. Yeah. Uh, on the on the inside part, because that's where all the friction occurs. So he'd be up. You've not been practicing at Dumjun, and so that's how he would basically quiz me every day to see if I've been practicing. But it was a group of um, these old men. I guess they almost look like hajis with with long beards, wearing all white traditional hats, no mustache, um, and they would ha be hanging around my my master's um, flat on the way to Old City Kashgar. Now, this is where they filmed Kite Runner for a frame of reference. Um, and so basically every single day after my lesson, um, as I would head into Center City, they would say, hey, you, get, 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 come, come over here, come over here, play a little cha, 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 cha. And they do like, instead of like the air guitar, they do like the air rawa, you know, so they get me to play a little bit. And so piece by piece over the course of six weeks, I'd play more and more of this song Tashvai. And on the final day of the sixth week, when I finally learned the entire composition from that day forth, they would say, hey, you, Tashvai, get over here and play us Tashvai again. And so they gave me this name of Tashvai, uh, and, and that was a huge honor uh, to me. I couldn't think of anything cooler. Um, and, you know, I put it on my student IDs, on everything. And that's how uh, I'm still known in Xinjiang to this day. And so uh, it is an epic song. I absolutely love it. Um, and well, we still have a little bit of time. Yeah. It'll give us a plenty of time for Q&A afterwards or perhaps a request from the audience. So <clears throat> here we go with Korban Ibrahim's reinterpretation of Tashvai.
Jim, can you, can you, um, I think that this is, this is the only instrument with a curved neck, right? You mean with the, uh, the, the head that has the crooked part, right? Right. The, with the, uh, sound box, uh, the, 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 the peg box here. No, actually the, um, the tar, this is a much older version of a tuning box, uh, Someone... like, like this, the, the tar, which is in this exact same family right here features the same technology. Uh, it's just, there's more wood to it. Someone had asked, um, can you say the name of this instrument again? The one with the curved neck. And I think yeah, this is, this is the, the Persian tar, T-A-R, and the Kashgar Rawap, R-A-W-A-P. Um, also, <laughs> Gail uh, Meister wants to know, can, can Adam explain his ethnomusicology, which I know you don't use that term, but uh, is no, it- I, I, I most certainly do. Um, I thought you didn't, but learning, is it learning to play the instruments, preserving the songs and tradition or question mark, question mark, or all of the above? All of uh, the above and so much more. Um, well, you, what you mentioned before about my, my graduate studies, uh, this is a European faculty of archaeomusicology. Arche um, these musical instruments do not preserve very well over time. There's very few musical instrument museums in the world. Um, and so basically a lot of what we know about the evolution of musical instruments or the study it's called organology um, comes from frescoes and, and Buddhist steles and a lot of uh, surviving terracotta figurines from archaeology. Um, but in terms of archaeomusicology, it, you know, that falls very much in the discipline of anthropology. And there's basically uh, two different types of anthropologists or, or ethnomusicologists and those who observe and they try to make recordings. Um, and then there are those who participate. And I very much fall into the uh, latter of these groups. Um, I, I, I never really learned musical theory. Um, I just get try to get a feel for the music as much as I can. And uh, while I do make notes and recordings, as much as I can, I try to use the traditional method of just learning from the master to apprentice and memorizing these songs. Um, in Kazakh, it's called Kurmankochak, or Um uh, They have other names for it, but it is basically the passing of this intangible cultural heritage across the generations. And so it's, uh, it's, it's just such a pleasure to be part of, of, of this uh, um, intergenerational uh, transmission. Um, and it's something that, you know, as I pass it along to you, uh, you know, I have a, a one-year-old son. Hopefully he'll be able to pick up one of these lutes at some point in the future. We'll have a nice little, uh, uh, I guess you could say, rekindling of this Silk Road tradition amongst ourselves as well. Do you think, I mean, have, have the instruments changed over the course of time or are they still i assume they're being made by mm. people who still use them but do, have they changed or do they keep the same basic structure no they they, they very much have been um i guess you could say alterations uh for example the the uzbek version of the rawap is called the rubop and so instead of the traditional tuning pegs you would have the gears like you would find on a guitar. And instead of the, the nylon frets, which uh, can be changed slightly to create microtones, depending on the certain uh, strong structure, um, they have the metal bars, again, like you would find in the guitar, mandolin, and other fretted instruments. So um, there have been Western assimilations to a lot of these instruments. But I would say beyond that, a, a lot of them have remained true to form, which is why you can look at uh, Buddhist steles from the 500s uh, that were transmitted from Persia to uh, China. And you can see instruments that not only resemble the, the pipa, for example, but are exactly what the pipa are. And we even know from records of how they were tuned and how they were plucked and strummed. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing to see uh how music may have sound uh millennia ago and there was a an, another this is not a uh really a, a question but a comment from from beth laser who said i toured central asia 
in 2019 and we visited the synagogue in Bukhara. Yes. Is this the only synagogue in the Central Asian countries? The Bukhara Jews considered themselves almost a different sect from Ashkenazi and Sephardic. Can you talk about them? Um, there is one, I guess you could say, I wouldn't say original, but still still existing um, to this day, this one synagogue that you, that you did mention, you go in there and you see a whole wall of the dignitaries that have visited over the years. Uh, I remember seeing a whole bunch of Hillary Clinton pictures when I was there uh, in 2013. Um, However, uh, I mean, this is this is of of the of, I guess you could say the branch of the Sephardic tradition, because I still think that you know they are Persian speaking, but they are further along the diaspora. Um, they still fall within that that realm. Uh, how they view themselves uh, is you know is always a, a completely different matter, especially since they were cut off from the rest of the Persian world with the Soviet Union split. Uh, the Soviet Union and, you know, uh, the Tsarist Russia and being cut off from the rest of the Sephardic populations of Persia, Iran, and elsewhere. However, when you are in Kazakhstan, there is a Chabad organization. Uh, you have the Lubavitch. Uh, you have other, um, you have other organizations that have created new synagogues because a lot of the, uh, I guess you could say, uh, diaspora again during the 1970s when a lot of Jews from the Soviet Union were allowed to leave for Israel and for the United States. Uh, many came from Ukraine, many came from places like Kazakhstan, and they, you know, had ties now with Israel. And so there are, uh, like the mitzvah organization has its own um, synagogue. And I guess you could say they're almost like, they're, cl they're very much closer to reform. So sometimes I would go to, to the Lubavitch when I was living in Kazakhstan. Um, for other holidays, I would celebrate at the at this mitzvah uh, center, um, and so while while I, I guess it's it's uncharacteristic to say that they're the only synagogue uh, in Central Asia, the mo the one that was uh, of this Bukhara tradition was raised, I think, in, in Tajikistan was raised in the early O's. Um, is a question whether it was the only one or whether there were more. I guess I guess you could say in the fact that it hasn't been reestablished recently since the fall of the Soviet Union or since you know the the 1970s diaspora that has existed for centuries, um, it is unique in that sense. But I would not call it uh, like the, as it unique in the sense that it's it's the only one of its kind. Has 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 the sound of this area crept into the Jewish musical sound. In other well, words, yeah, the song, I mean, the one that I played for you, Zofi Parashon, I was singing this one, not in the Tajiki dialect, I was singing it in the Bukharan dialect. And so at uh, bar mitzvahs and at weddings, this song is always played uh, with amongst the Bukharan populations in Tel Aviv, and especially in Queens. Uh, Kew Gardens, um, and it is it is very much part of their musical tradition. Um, I would say the Central Asians in influenced this musical tradition as much as the Jews did because they were developed uh, together uh, with the Jews that played a very strong part of the musical courts and the emirs and uh, Bukhara and Hiva and the other oases city states along the Silk Road. It's, it's, it's really, um, I don't think we think very much here in this country that there are Jews in Central Asia. I mean, it doesn't really, <laughs> we don't really sort of assume that there are Jews there. And uh, it would- well, When I'm traveling over there, you can always count on this guy right here. <laughs> um, but even as far as China, so that in, in Kaifeng, in Hunan province, the first time I studied in China, I was in Chengdu, Sichuan at the Southwest University for Nationalities. And I learned of the Kaifeng Jews that have been there since uh, I think the sixth century. And uh, not far from Chengdu, there was even um, in the uh, the Buddhist caves in cave number 17 of Dunhuang in Gansu province, uh, just north of, uh, when you basically go from uh, Western China into China proper, you go along the Gansu corridor and the Silk Road kind of hooks up again in the, in the oasis of Dunhuang in the Gobi Desert. And it's there at the Mogao Ku, the Thousand Buddha Caves, in Cave 17, where there's this hidden library of texts with all of these 
incredibly well-preserved documents over the years. Um, one of which is an eighth century, I think it's pronounced as Simicha, or it's like the letter of forgiveness. So it's a Jewish text written in Hebrew from the eighth century that the uh, famed archeologist, Paul Pelio, um, Sinologist as well, he was able to bring back in, I believe, 1911 to the um, Bibliothèque Nationale de France, uh, the National Library of France. Uh, all of the other remaining documents uh, from this period um, were basically at the British Library, and that's where I did my undergraduate thesis, where it is currently held the world's oldest printed document from 538 called the Diamond Sutra. The only way, no way that we know that it's document is because it was they, it was dated as the dur written during the seventeenth year of like the Taiyuan uh, Emperor's reign. Um, other than that, when I was studying the Pipa in northeast China, there's a Jewish graveyard from all of the uh, Jews who uh, escaped uh, during I guess you could say World War II, and uh, even like what was it, Ehman Olbert's uh, uh, grandfather was is buried there, uh, the former Prime Minister of Israel. And so it's it's interesting. And Shanghai also had its great population yeah. of, of dispersed Jews during World War II. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's incredible that even even to this day, uh, you, you'd still find at least I was able to find Jewish populations of expats living in Beijing. And so, uh, you know, during Christmas, as you know, we always have Chinese food. Uh, on Christmas here. So in Beijing, all of the Jewish expats would hold this big banquet on Christmas with with uh, Jewish and Chinese food. And it was it was just a, it it's it's really interesting to see how these parallels uh, reverberate and echo over time. Yeah, I had a colleague uh, on the faculty at Drexel whose family waited too long in Germany. And they took the Trans-Siberian Railroad. They ended up in Shanghai in that mm -hmm. and there was quite a large community in Shanghai. Um, there was a question here that uh, I don't think I, I repeated this. If I did, tell me. Um, it, Gail, Gail Meister says, is this music considered folk or formal classical by the people who play it? Or is that not a relevant distinction? Uh, there most definitely is a distinction. So when I was playing um, from the 12 Mukam, the first song on the Rawap, you could say that's very much a classical uh, co composition. And because of you know the the, uh, uh, the cultural policies of the People's Republic of China, it's very much frozen and 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 uh, it's it's inescapable in 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 its form and composition. It is classical music, whereas. The other song, Tashvai, is very much regional to Kashgar, to that one specific uh, oasis uh, that pepper the Takl Taklamakan Desert. Um, and so that is very much a folk song. Um, whereas there's, uh, on, the, on the Dombra, I mentioned that there was the traditional uh, uh, genre of the Kui, kind of like the blues. And that is different from where you have uh, the oral epics, where the bards are, are, are really singing poetry on top of just the most basic musical underlines. And so there, there very much are different regional distinctions. Uh, and you also distinguish whether it's, it's uh, uh, musical traditions that are uh, formed at the behest of the sultans or emirs um, or within the courts themselves, or if there's something generated and just gain popularity among the common folk. There is, um, I just saw another comment. Um, Marcia Bas Basicki, Basics, said, I, I'm sorry if I, I got that wrong, said my father's family has lived in China for almost 300 years. They lived in Harbin, See, today yes. they live in Shanghai. So that's, that's, where, um, that's where I was studying uh, the Pipa in Northeast China. Uh, was it was in Harbin? Okay. Yes. And there's a request from um, oh sure uh, Sidavi Kuang to a uh, song request. If you have time, can you play a song from the from the oud guitar? Do they play the oud in Central Asia? Uh, the oud is uh, well, I got this in Spain. And only because my parents had, had, you know, my mother had visited Morocco, they had an RV and they were able to go
go around there. So I only basically have been able to study this uh, through Skype. I don't know if I have it perfectly tuned at this at this moment, but I would I would mo most certainly say that the the Sephardics, especially the Jews of Morocco, I've seen many many clips on YouTube, have employed the oud uh, in in their performance practices. Well, this has been, uh, we've still got, we've still got 10 more. Well, we're in, we're in, actually we're in question time now, but I think we've been doing question time all along. So if anyone has any more questions, please throw them into the chat and otherwise um, put them in the chat. The questions go in the chat. Okay. Um, Adele, there's a question from Ben Zion. I know. I just told, I I was just looking and I said just put them in the chat. Can't do it. Right. Can't do it. No. What, Sorry. What is the no, question? Not a problem. Go right ahead. Uh, what is the question? It's about klezmer music. How, if, if in any way, does klezmer uh, connect to this? Well, I kind of like to think of of, of my musical journey that was in uh, the small town of Vladimir. Um, it was very much reminiscent of, well, at least I was able to identify with Fiddler on the Roof and how you had basically the shtetl in one section and, you know, you had lots of uh, uh, klezmer compositions throughout that musical. And then you would have the Russian, uh, the Russians and then the Cheka uh, come and do their, you know, their, their amazing dances and they have the music as well. Um, and so while I think that that uh, the Slavic music and klezmer music, they are distinct. There are a lot of similarities where the bass root is noted, the the instrumentation, for example, the use of brass and clarinets, things along this nature. But there are differences. Um, that is that is to be sure. And, and the most obvious of which is, you know, the use of Yiddish as opposed to uh, as opposed to Russian. But in many klezmer compositions today, they, they still would use Russian. Um, so I guess you could say it's, it's part of the same musical sphere, but uh, there, there, there are similarities and more, more clear distinctions as well. We have uh, two or three other questions here. First, what do you do at the Smithsonian? Uh, well, that's good. Uh, so right now, because of the pandemic, uh, everything is remote. And I still believe that the, all of the museums have been uh, have been closed uh, at the Asian Cultural History Program. Uh, we establish a lot of partnerships with institutions abroad. Um, and one of the major ones that I've been helping with has been, has been with the uh, Katseyev Museum. That's the National Museum of, of Kazakhstan. And together we did an online ethnography of Cholkan Valikhanov. And he was one of these explorers during the Great Game. And he was friends with Dostoevsky, uh, his contemporary at the time. And he was the first anthropologist to make notation of the Manas epic. This is the Kyrgyz national epic poetry and music that has been, uh, uh, by some sources, it's, it's multiple times longer than the Odyssey and Iliad combined. It is massive. Manas is one of their great epic heroes. Um, you know, again, featured on the currency, universities, statues, cities, and the, and the like. Um, and not only that, he was in uh, uh, Xinjiang during the Ulugbeg uprising, I believe, of 1860 that happened around uh, Kashgar and Yarkhani uh, in the southern, south uh, western part of, of Xinjiang. Um, with other, uh, other places where I'm currently a cultural advisor, this would include the Tajik Cultural Center, which is the cultural branch of the Tajik Embassy uh, to the United Kingdom. And um, together with their, with their Tajik Cultural Center, they are doing a lot of, um, I guess you could say virtual sites of archeological, uh, yeah, virtual sites of archeological sites, um, such as Sarazem, which is, uh, they recently had its 5,500th anniversary. And I am developing an online Zoom-based language program uh, with them and, and other sorts of partnerships. Um, one more, uh, one comment. Well, actually, it's a, it's a question and a comment. Were you in Harbin in the winter? Is it shiveringly cold? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and then let me give you the other one too. Uh, Julia Williams says the 
the Silk Roads were a trade network. Goods moved great distances and often ended up far from where they were made. Did yes. musical traditions migrate also? They most certainly did. Uh, and many times with religions. So for example, I mentioned Buddhism, for example. And when Buddhism was tra transversed uh, into China, it was accompanied by the music. A lot of these musical instruments had not been seen in China beforehand. Uh, they were not these huge slabs of stones or, or bells uh, that have been known since the age of Confucian. Um, but with them, they brought uh, lutes and the double-ended drum, which you would find in India, and many of the harps and lyres, which are mentioned again in the Book of Psalms, that were um, uh, before the uh, uh, what is it, Sassanid and Achaemenid. You have the Assyrian and Babylonian dynasties uh, in the area of, of the Near East and, and Persia uh, of today. Um, and so uh, absolutely, uh, I mean, languages, music, cultural traditions, food, spices, you name it, even, uh, you know, people uh, were mass migrated there, you know, as, as, as empires wax and wane, a lot of forced deportation migration. Um, and uh, in regards to the other question, uh, the best time to visit Harbin, in my opinion, is only during the winter time. And so, yes, I arrived during the fall semester. It was rather muggy and swampish and warm at the beginning, but oof, it was blistering cold by the end. And I basically chose during that year in China, I went from Harbin, which is the northeast, to Urumqi, no the northwest, and they would have to be the absolute two coldest places to live in China. But um, there were also, at least for a Russian-speaking and Russian-speaking person in China, they are the most russified because again you have a lot of uh russian populations uh russian population in in harbin in the northeast and then they would have a lot what they would call soviet populations peoples from uh kazakhstan and kyrgyzstan that would be living in xinjiang because in xinjiang you also have lots of kazakh and kyrgyz as well well i think that that's going to wind up pretty much our formal um class i want to thank you so much adam it was just really really interesting and and fun and My pleasure um, actually i think since we have just three minutes left well stick around for uh, for 15 or so afterwards if you don't mind may i cap off with just one short composition would that be okay yeah there was just a couple of things i i i need to i I need to, you could do that in the, in the 15 minutes afterward uh, or start. The thing is, I just, a couple of things that, that I have to say, that's all. Sure. Um, number one, will the participants please fill out the feedback forms that RS will email to you after class. And um, there are a couple more classes tomorrow. Don't forget that. And then, uh, what is Susan? What is this covenant of interaction? Sure, let me share this so we get into our this is the right page. When we get into the uh, just the, the chat, we want to remember yeah. that we're all here for a common purpose and we should treat everyone with respect. Um, be aware of how much space you're taking, balance talking with listening. Okay, fine. That's good. Um, go ahead, go Adam. <laughs> All right. So uh, one other song, I mean, when, when, when other people break a string on the guitar, I always say to them, you know, you got nothing to worry about. If you break another four or five strings and you're just down to one, then come at me. Cause then, then after that you have a problem. Cause until you just have one string left, you can still play music. Um, this one song is another personal favorite. This is a modern composition. Uh, as opposed to the older one I played of Bob Raoun about the ponies in the step. But this one is an interpretation of uh, a rainstorm and it's called Waves of Happiness. Um, and it's called Konal Tokuna. And it has a, I believe it's a 5-5 five -five rhythm. And it is just so incredibly expressive that it's uh, it just ranks up there among my personal favorites. And so it's just a, a pleasure to be able to end off this discussion with just one more uh, Musical All right, tradition. Go ahead and let me Sofra. say one thing. Thank you, Susan, for being for being a great tech angel. 
Now go, Adam, go ahead. Thank you so much uh, for coming, everybody. Again, name, my name is Adam Grode, a Silk Road ethnomusicologist. You can reach me across my social medias at Adam Grode. I'm um, always open and welcome for any questions if you'd like to follow up. But for now, thank you again for attending. And if there's any more questions for this moment, please. Well, we've yeah. got until uh, 6.30, you've got, um, you've got an open discussion. Uh, everybody will get unmuted, I assume. Right, Susan? Everyone can unmute themselves, yes. Yes, everybody can unmute yourselves and um, go to it. Just be nice to one another. <laughs> thank Hi, Adam. You. This was Hello. really interesting. Yeah, um, thank you so much for this incredible class. But I have, I have a question. Sure. Um, is there any overlap between the Jewish music that you learned and the music of the Uyghurs? Um, oh. I would say that I would say definitely because uh, there's the six mukam, the shash mukam from Bukhara, and then you have the oniki mukam, uh, which is the twelfth mukam um, from from Xinjiang, and many of them they they they, they feature the exact same uh, corpus of of musical instruments, and a lot of the same melodies and modes um, are, are very they're they're very much like cultural cousins between one another. It's so interesting. Yes, it certainly is. And so, e even though I mean, with um, with the formation of the Soviet Union and then and then the People's Republic of China, uh, I mean, even after the fall of the Qing Dynasty in nineteen eleven, um, you know, before then there were centuries of of, of cross cultural connections, uh, regardless of borders. Um, and I think to this day, there's there's a lot of uh, of uh, um, I guess you could say infusion of Western styles. It's interesting um, in Xinjiang and also Uzbekistan, there's a really deep 
identification with like flamenco music as the way that they access modern uh, I guess you could say Western traditions. And so a lot of pop songs would have, if they do incorporate guitar, um, that it would be a lot of like, I guess you could say almost flamenco style. Uh, synthesizers are used across the board, but it's interesting because of the way that the dutar is played and there's tapping and strumming and pull-offs and everything. Uh, flamenco styles, which again is connected throughout the Muslim world from Iberian Peninsula uh, all the way to Indonesia, um, I guess there's a, still a bit of resonance of that that they can identify with today. Thank you. Anybody else? Got two people who want to buy a record from you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Hey, who is we, uh, we're wondering what your. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Hey guys. Okay. We're wondering what your favorite country to visit was. Um. Well, China was incredibly dynamic, but I would I would say so far it's. I mean. The last country that I visited was was Tajikistan, um, and I am so enamored with this country. It's it. I mean, by far it was the poorest country I've been to, but the, it is the most welcoming, uh, open society that I've ever traveled to. Um, and I mean, I, I went I went into the program already speaking Russian, even though I was there to learn Tajiki and and and. Uh, you know, and uh, the music of the Shashmukam within just a couple of months. Uh, each time, it's always just a couple of months like that I have this opportunity. Um, I just had three months when I was in Russia, a f two months for the Arhu. Uh, the only exception was on the Kashgar Rawap and on the, and on the uh, Kazakh Dombra, where I had years of opportunities uh, to learn. Um, but I honestly, I cannot wait to go back to, to Tajikistan. Um, and uh, explore more of this uh, Bukharan traditions uh, there and in Uzbekistan as well. But mainly the Shashmukam tradition, I would say, and, and the fact that it's uh, a per officially a Persian speaking country. Um, I, I just, honestly, I can't wait to go back there. It's speaking Farsi? Um, well, whether you call it Farsi or Dari or Tajiki, um, it's, I, be, I and a lot of other scholars refer to them just as all as Persian, as mm -hmm. basically one language with s slight dialects, whereas you might have a lot more cultural terms and, and terms from French in, in Farsi um, because of the more uh, exchanges in the early 20th century. There would be obviously more, um, uh, uh, I, there's a lot more Russian cognates in, in Tajiki, but the, the, it's it's almost as similar as as Spanish and Italian, if not closer. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, so I have a question. Uh, I I would have thought that all the different stands that that the culture was um, homogeneous among them, but as oh. I'm listening to you, it doesn't sound like that at all. So. Are all these contiguous countries nonetheless differentiated in their culture? Uh, I would, absolutely. Um, I mean, you have, uh, uh, there's, w within uh, Kazakhstan, for example, Kazakhstan is a vast country. I mean, there's, it's the ninth largest in the world, but within the, the uh, within Kazakhstan, there's separation between like the hordes, the, the, the greater hordes, and then they have tribes within that. Um, and this is part of the Turkic family. This is called the Kapchak uh, family. So Kyrgyz and Kazakhs are both Kapchaks. Uh, whereas, say, uh, the Turks of Anatolia and Azerbaijan, they are of the Oghuz part of the Turkic family. And, uh, and Uzbeks and Uyghurs, they are uh, the Olmecs. This is another branch of the Turkic family. And again, within like the uh, the Persian family, there's also different branches, whether it's Kurdish or Dari or or uh, or, or, or Tajiki. Uh, the, I mean, there are differences with the with the musical traditions, and obviously, as I mentioned, with the geopolitics of uh, whether you know they had independence and then closer closer, closer affiliations with Europe as opposed to Russia, um, or even with uh, Xinjiang, where there's. Uh, uh, even, even though Uzbek and Uyghur are almost the same language, there's now such a great diffusion of Chinese words in, in, uh, in Uyghur today uh, that it really takes on local characteristics. It's a vast area, 
multiple multiple language families and religions and, and traditions, uh, which is why I personally was so enchanted with it, just because of how incredibly diverse the old world melting pot, if you will. It looks like China is going to try really trying to sort of decimate the Uyghur, though. That, I mean, that is the idea both. I mean, I was there in 2009 during the huge ethnic riot. Uh, I was quoted across the board because I was the first person to mention what was happening to uh, the embassy and international media. Uh, so I was quoted by AP and the New York Times and the Guardian. And uh, I was actually arrested on three separate occasions, uh, uh, interrogated. My, my passport was confiscated. The att uh, attache from the embassy had to come out and argue for my passport to be uh, given back to me. Um, it, it was a very difficult, very difficult time. Uh, but given how much money the Chinese are pouring into the infrastructure and their one belt, one road policy, honestly, I, I thought that the, the response would have been much, much heavier than it is today as, as, uh, as, as awful as, as the situation is, um, I, I thought it would be much, much worse. Uh, and, you know, things could always get worse or better, but I mean, just as the, as the trends can, you know, as you can observe them today, uh, it does not look very good uh, for the future of the region in terms of uh, pre the preservation of Uyghur traditions. Mm -hmm. Ugh. Talking to me? I don't, hmm? I Anybody else? I have a question. Go ahead, please. Uh, where do the Bukharian Jews fit in? You're mentioning all the different groups that are in the area mm -hmm. and how, how do they play a part? Uh, well, they were part of, I guess, the, the region between uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan is where the, the Persian speaking community of Central Asia exists. And it was Stalin who basically carved up all of these areas creating enclaves and little islands and really a jigsaw map of central asia that separated a lot of these populations from each other to create uh inter inter strife between the countries themselves and never any sort of cohesion um but the bukharan jews most definitely fit into the traditions with the tajikis with the uh, emirs of the city states that were the last to be taken by the Tsarist government in the, I believe, the 1860s and 70s, um, such as Hiva and Bukhara uh, and Kuljan uh, and those sorts of areas down to towards the Pamir Mountains. Um, there's a little sliver of Afghanistan. If anyone's familiar with the shape of the way Afghanistan looks, there's a little sliver towards the end that then touches with China. And this is called the Wahan Corridor. Uh, where Wahai is, is, is spoken, it's an endangered language, but this little sliver, I believe it's 60 kilometers wide, it was created specifically as a buffer between uh, the British Raj, which after the second, I think, Af Afghan war in the mid 19th century, they created this sort of buffer so there would not be a direct border between Tsarist Russia and the British Raj. And that, uh, you know, geographical remnants remains to this day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. My pleasure. It was fun. Definitely was fun. Thank you all for coming. We've got, I think, one more session of Day of Learning tomorrow. So we hope you'll join that, that with us. I also do bar mitzvahs. <laughs> um, <just> <laughs> But again, thank you so much for hosting me. It was my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm very appreciative for this opportunity to share with you uh, this world on a string, this musical journey, which I've been blessed to have so many opportunities uh, from so many different organizations to have partaken in and now to give back and share with the community with you. It's wonderful because, you know, uh, who knew? I mean, it, it's, you know, it. we sit here in our Western world and um, probably can't, look at a map and say exactly where it is all of that okay susan <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much it was really wonderful i really appreciate it my pleasure cheers all right everyone thank have you. a good evening thank, thank you all the best to you thank you all right i think we're done i think we're done but that was great That's a wrap. Yep.